All right. Welcome to the Healthy Indoors Live Show. I'm your host, Bob Krell. I'm founder and publisher of Healthy Indoors Magazine. And hey, thanks for joining us on this uh, fine Thursday. I am super excited today. Uh, today, our, our, we're joined by a guest who I have just had undying respect for, a uh, gentleman that I've known for, I, I'm, I'm ashamed to admit, a lot of years. It's, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, it's like, uh, so without further ado, uh, he, he's really has, has, you know, this guy's been, been a perennial force in this industry forever, and he's the most modest guy, I'll never admit it. Uh, but Terry Brennan, uh, he was a co-founder of Cam Rodden, Cam Roden Associates. That's how you pronounce it, right, Cam Roden? Yeah. Um, and you've been in the industry for 40 plus years ish yeah since 1979 really yeah wow so that's a while i mean i started in 86 <laughs> you know and, and i thought i was old but it, i mean <laughs> you, you are know, old you, <laughs> I, I, I am old i know that's that's the problem um but one of the things you know terry you've always been like just the most humble yet brilliant guy in this industry and you're just you're just a, i mean i i'm i'm gonna keep blowing wind up your skirt but you just like you're the most likable <laughs> dude you just are everybody loves you man i mean it's like and it, and it's because you actually are humble and super knowledgeable and you're really just just a great person to speak with and you just seem to you you've always been at the front of a lot of the initiatives in the industry i know you were one of the uh, principal authors of the building air quality book with EPA, right? Years and years ago. Yeah. Uh, that's a long time. Su Susan Galbraith and who else, who else is on that? Who else? Uh, Bill Turner and uh, Laura Sorry, Oatman Bill. from the Minnesota okay. Department of Health. Um, we're involved in that. And then the, and the EPA side, Betsy Agle was the uh, project manager for the indoor environments division, the indoor air division that was back then. And, you know, what's, what's interesting is that, um, you know, you, you've, you've been just quietly involved in research and, and just, you know, you, you're, you're a regularly feature presenter. You have been throughout your career. And I, I know like over the years, I think we met in the <clears throat> early 1990s. I was trying to place that today when I was thinking about <clears throat> it. And I remember there was there used to be a publication upstate New York called uh, Business Journal. I think it was Central New York Business Journal or something. And they used to do yeah. events. We met like, yeah. and, and they would have like, quarterly or something and usually they'd be in Syracuse and I think we both presented at one back in the early 90s on indoor air quality like 91 or 92 and I think that's when we first met face to face um and uh, you know right out right out of the blocks I said well this guy knows his stuff <laughs> <laughs> I could learn from this man <laughs> um you know and we've just had you know over the years we had so many opportunities to cross paths and you know we were, I guess we yeah. were competitors in a weird way but I never felt like you and I were competitors I, I always viewed you as a colleague yeah, that that's generally my philosophy in, in life. It's much better sharing and cooperating than not. Yeah, and it's you know it's funny that I think maybe a lot of people don't adopt that and they should, right? <laughs> <laughs> just just uh -huh. a little. Um, so uh, you're you're retired, and you know, we were talking about that in the pre-show. Um, you know, or you're semi-retired. <laughs> so so yeah, mostly, tell, tell us what that means. What does that mean? <laughs> it, it, it's it's a lot like um, in the Princess Bride being mostly dead. Okay. <laughs> I don't even have a follow up for that. Retired. <laughs> so I mean, you're still slightly, slightly involved in the industry. You still, like you mentioned, you still, you still do some consulting work on a limited yeah. basis. Yeah. Yes, I, I do some consulting work, and uh, and I. I you know, I'm, I'm going through the lab and the office files, and, um, and it's like, God, let's see, it's like 102 file drawers of case files and research project, uh, all the documentation for the research projects and technical information. And, and, and it's it's odd that I, I have... Uh, I, 30 file drawers of technical information, but I never go to it. I, I just search on the web and I can find a copy of what I'm looking for faster usually than if I go to the file drawers. Well, that, that I mean, that is one of the things that has changed. Yeah. Our, 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 our access to information, both good and bad, is a lot more readily available. <laughs> But it's interesting. I mean, you you know, you've been uh, I mean, you've really had a part in so many pieces of the puzzle that make up this, you know, this industry. And I, w one of the things I wanted to really uh, highlight is that your approach 
to the indoor environmental issues was always from a building scientist standpoint. I remember from this, I believe, right? That was that was always your tactic. So I remember you first introduced me, uh, maybe mid '90s or late '90s, talking about using blower doors and doing that, you know, pressurization testing. And yeah. in the I, you know, the the original IQ guys didn't do that. And I know you came from that group with Bill Turner and all you guys that all did that. But most right. of us really were not not in tune attuned to that at all. And uh, yeah, you you changed my whole direction in the early 2000s uh, from that. You know, I went and say, hey, I better get some BPI uh, accreditation and start, you know, <laughs> yeah. start learning this stuff because it's like, you know, this is yeah. we're, we're I was leaving a lot of the uh, the knowledge on the table for too many years. And I, I'd be too quick to do uh, testing. Yeah. It, well, it, yeah. It's it'd be like, you know, studying coyotes without thinking about the forest ecology and uh, other all the other creatures and plants that are involved in their life. The no. environment is like that. It, it makes sense. Um, I, I, so I remember, so here's, here's what I'm going to keep throwing stories back because, you know, all the years uh, we've known each other. I remember <laughs> I one time. I deny were, everything in demand. Yeah, well, you, yeah, just go categorically put a blanket denial on it and you'll be all sad. <laughs> yeah, I but I remember we were out at, like, we went out and we're on some Where's project. Where's Shaughnessy's fault? <laughs> it was Shaughnessy's fault. Well, we were out on, on uh, some project somewhere on some, you know, doing for odors in an apartment building. And I was like, getting oh, yeah. ready to go down the path of saying let's take samples and do gc mass spec analysis on it and you're like why don't we take pieces of each individual constituent in the building stick them in a mason jar and whiff it yeah and like, <laughs> you know <laughs> hey that makes way too much sense <laughs> and and sometimes it works good you, you find it and you know what's really good about that is when you find it and you ask the people who are having the problems in the building is just the smell if it's the smell, they know it instantly, and and now they believe that that they can trust us. No, it, it makes it makes total sense, and I, I think again, you've always, and that's one of the things that I've always just super respected and really marveled at with you is that you just always use a very common sense approach to things. Not that you're not very scientifically technical, because you are. I mean, you're so, you, I mean, you, you know, I mean, look at, you've got a, uh, you know, a psychometric chart on your chest. Yeah, yeah really. <laughs> I mean, that is, you establish credibility as soon as you Another started. fashion statement, right? <laughs> you know, well, you know, we're, I mean, um, we're both known for that. Here, here, let's make sure we get a good look at it. Yeah, yeah. there you go. Yes. Uh, <laughs> what is the absolute humidity in your uh, current uh, abode? <laughs> so, uh, you, I, you, I mean, you've just had you've had just a, like a remarkable journey in this industry, and and you know you've really, I, I think you've been at the forefront of just a lot of the stuff that we do today, um, which, which is just remarkable. Um, and you, I always always amazed at what a road warrior you were too. You know, you just be everywhere all the time. You're always you traveled so much Traveling, yeah that well was that, tough, that right? was a that, that was an oversight on my part when i when i figured out that my career path is going to be building science and um and it, it didn't occur to me that you can't say wow that's pretty interesting could you bring that in on tuesday <laughs> you, you know you kind of have to yeah, you, had to go, you, you have had to go, go to the building. <laughs> if you don't go to the building, you're probably not going to figure it out. <laughs> yeah, and so that's a, that's a downside there. You kind of drew yourself into a life of hotels. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I, I don't particularly. I enjoy being other places, but I don't really enjoy getting there that much. <laughs> well, especially now, right? It hasn't gotten any better in the last several years. Oh, yeah. When it really got horrible, the first, the first plunge into a horrible travel was uh when they deregulated the airlines mm -hmm. when mm -hmm. they could just like keep taking inches away from your uh seat space <laughs> yeah it, it was it was horrible my, and because a lot of the places that i was traveling to weren't disney world or san francisco or los angeles my average ticket price doubled yeah with deregulation. <laughs> and, and so you flew, prim did you fly out of Syracuse mostly or did you fly out yeah. of Albany? Okay. Yeah, so Syracuse, Syracuse is terrible mostly. expensive. Terrible yeah, Sy expensive. Syracuse has always been very it's expensive. Awful. <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's crazy. Uh, it still is. I mean, it hasn't gotten any better. If, if anything, it's gotten, you, you get less space for more dollars. I mean, I'm, I'm waiting for the point where they start selling airline tickets and the seat is the optional thing. You don't get a seat. <laughs> like, you know, it's like a bus and you're standing up holding the like, handle. Um, yeah. Like a Chevy Blazer. Remember Chevy Blazers? 
the 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 the, the back seat and the passenger seat were options. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> in the, in the place here. optional, you know, op yeah. optional seat. You know, yeah. Yeah, I mean, they're charging yeah. for bags now. You know, so you know they don't get, they won't give any snacks. I get the snacks. That isn't that important. But you know, like I kind of like to not have my knees. And I'm a little guy, and I'm crowded. I I don't understand how how same with me. You know, I'm I'm 150 pounds and five five nine and. They, they, I I fill up those seats on those uh, regional airplanes. Yeah, I don't know coach how... is truly uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Really. So, but but you're I mean you're at the point in your career where if somebody does fly you somewhere you probably can demand first class at least get that. Um, yeah, you know, first class does actually help a lot because they treat you almost like you're a human being. You know, that's, I, yes, okay, so I was, I found that on a trip a few weeks ago where, you know, things got a little messed up, and you get, you right, if you're a first-class traveler, you get treated a lot better than everybody else on the plane. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know, for for that privilege, they charge you, like, twice the price for the ticket, but. Yeah, yeah, it, it's it's way expensive to travel anyway. So. Yeah, yeah, so far, yeah. travel's, uh, travel's not what it used to be. I mean, I, I think since 9-11, it, it's been, you know, it, the regulatory and all you know just the the weights and the delays and i'm not sure we're any safer either but you know whatever we, you know we're going through that <laughs> you know we're we're, go, we're going through that exercise every time but yeah, and now since the pandemic is like bleh, i mean like you know traveling with a mask oh, on yeah. your face and i i haven't flown actually the last two or three years oh okay I'm trying to remember the last time i actually flew yeah, it's not, it's, it's really, well, you don't have to wear your mask anymore, but, um, you know, my last mm -hmm. trip, this is the best part. I, I went to a conference and, uh, <laughs> well, you, we got COVID again, you know, you, so that was, you, you, you probably should though, because well, I don't, I, actually, I haven't looked at the data in three or four weeks, but it, the death rate was climbing again. And, I, this is, and this the, we, you can't, you can't depend on uh, case, case numbers anymore because mm -hmm. people test at home. Yeah, and, yeah, that, that's nobody true. reports that data or collects that data. So that's completely use almost completely useless for us now. Yeah, and, it's, um, it's been a challenge. Hospitalizations are another one you can look at. Well, as but, far as census in the hospital, seeing what yeah, but the death, the, when the death rate climb starts climbing again, you know there's something going on. And there's a well, lot more cases out there. So, um, yeah, that I mean, that's it has from your perspective have you seen you know a, a shift in in the industry in the indoor environmental side you know maybe for general public and also on the industry side uh you know are, are we globally more attuned to indoor environmental concerns now since we've been hit with an you know aerosol pan aerosolized uh virus uh or is this is this a short i guess my question is the long question is Will, will there be a paradigm shift as a result of this, or is this just a short thing that we're dealing with, and we'll go right back to stupidity again? I I, I can't judge anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's your perspective? <laughs> well, the the um, it, it cl clearly uh, COVID, you know, SARS two is is a, a an organism, a disease of of indoor indoor air. It's the, that's where nearly all of the transmission occurs is in the indoor spaces. So it is an indoor air quality problem in, in many ways, and and it's in, it and worldwide we've handled as a species we've handled it very poorly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean I I couldn't disagree with that. Um, and, but this, I've been saying this for like the last two plus years now, this should be a launch pad for us, I believe, as, you know, at least let's say even just our country, I can't speak globally, but just for our country, that we should take, you know, take things a little bit more seriously as far as how we do our indoor built spaces and, you know, really make the consideration of, you know, the healthiness for the occupants kind of an important concern. You know, I would like to hope we could do that. Uh, there are certain, certainly a lot, lots of us who are trying to do that. Yeah. So, I mean, but, I guess, yeah, but will so, we go, I guess, will we go back? Science, you know, science has, has lost a, a lot of cachet <laughs> you know, over the past 10, 15 years. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I, I'm, we had uh, Dr. Dave, do you know David Krause? 
Uh, oh yeah, sure. Yeah, okay, so I figured you knew Dave. Dave's yeah, been on the absolutely. show a lot, and uh, you know, he's he, you know, having been a public health official, you know, and a, and you now he's a private sector practitioner now, but he, you know, yeah. he's a public health official on two different stints with the uh, Florida Department of Health, and you know, he yeah. always said that we. At the early stages of the pandemic, I kept saying, well, you know, CDC, and he's like, you're expecting these entities, you know, to behave in ways they're not going to. They've been gutted the last 20, 30 years, and, you know, they're mostly political hacks. And like he was saying that right from the start, he goes, you're not going to get saved by these people. <laughs> I, 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 was, I was surprised uh, at how badly that was managed initially with, yeah. with, the, with the testing not being uh, effective and widespread well with everything honestly I mean, we just didn't we didn't handle it well at all and you know but it was funny I, I read an article from back in 1918 with the spanish flu yeah and and it, it seems that this resistance to wearing masks is not a new american trait in 1918 oh. <laughs> people were having they, there were there was a protest in san francisco with over 10,000 people bitching and moaning about having to wear face coverings <laughs> and protesting in 1918 you know yeah. saying it's like you know it's it, it, this is against our rights that we shouldn't have to do <laughs> so this, this, is, this is nothing new <laughs> and anyway, what does that mean <laughs> <laughs> anyway but uh, you, you know if you read the oldest literature in in any culture uh, you you find that people behaved in those um 5,000 year old stories, just exactly like we behave now. <laughs> so I, no, I, so look, I at, look at the Iliad and the Odyssey. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, or read, read the, the, the Peloponnesian Wars. The, the, that, the, I haven't read that. Any of that. Oh, oh. You, I guess I, so that, that's what is, I'm going to well, when Bobby, I when I go to work retirement, I'll, I'll your ass in gear. I know, I know. I'm running out of years, too. I don't have that much time on the clock. Uh, but the Peloponnesian War, the the um, that that series of uh, um, documents were written by a retired Athenian general, uh, and and he, he described the the plague that that decimated Athens, which is why Sparta won, and at the end of uh, forty years of war, um, Athens lost because of a plague. And and he he is he was just a brilliant observer um, and kind of laid out a, a, a number of the fundamental um, principles of, of public health um, back in those days. And, and so and those pr principles still hold water today. You think? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Like or yeah, you know the other really the if you can um, find any of the the remnants of the Romans uh, camp, R Roman armies camp hygiene principles. They 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 had a school that, de that devoted to camp hygiene, um, and and which is in in a great many ways why they were an effective army. Mm -hmm. as, they actually they, they <laughs> reduced some of the massive uh, plague like <laughs> situations. They still ate off of lead lead. Uh, <laughs> well, they didn't eat well. <laughs> they didn't. They didn't have it totally. <laughs> it, it, it's 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 true, but and, but if you're if you're not suffering from dysentery, you're a better fighter than. <laughs> Clearly, right? That, that makes sense. So you know, take a little shift here. So you, uh, you know, again, you've uh, you've always uh, really taken that building science approach. You know, so even though you know we, you know, I think people in the industry consider you an indoor air quality guru, you know, and, and like one of the formative people, you know, in the er earlier uh, days of the industry as it was starting to evolve a little. Um, you, but you always took that approach, you know, and how, how did you get there? Like, where, where, where did you start so that you looked at it from that, you know, with that lens? Does that make uh, in, during the oil embargo, it was the, the so 72, 73. Yeah, yeah. Uh, oil prices skyrocketed and there were lines. You could only get gas on every other day or depending on the what your license plate number ran to an odd or an even number and stuff like that. Um, and, and I thought, I you know, I grew up in a building family and um, my, my uncle was part owner of Evans and Ross Construction, 
my first job was a Mason's tender um, and, and in which I learned my first building science principle, which is if they're not going to see it, don't bother to strike the joints. Okay. And, well, <laughs> yeah, that, 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 that looks means, good for my, that goes right along with looks good for my house. <laughs> yeah, exa that's exactly, that's exactly it. The, it, it means that, it, you know, if, in the in the ceiling plenum above the corridor in the, your public school, the, there's holes into the hollow core wall and that they're all the, the whole corridor wall is now a plenum. And, and it's being depressurized by the air handler and sucking it. <laughs> so you can transport all kinds of contaminants or odors or particulate matter through because because there's these pat, hidden pathways there there's holes and passages that or ordin, ordinary people wouldn't think of as being a, a way to transport carbon monoxide from the tuck under garage to the fourth floor of an apartment building and that's one of really one of the fundamental principles of you know even the whole building air quality book you know is that the 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 uh the transport mechanism right for a pollutant to be a problem it has to get from where it is to the occupant right yeah and if you can't deal i mean it's uh, pathways it's, it's all pathways. It's obvious that if you can get rid of the source that that's the way to go but if the source is the kids or the source is a carpet or a paint that's reacting with uh, sulfur compounds and the gypsum, then, then you you can't you can't you can't get rid of that source in any easy way, and you can't put an exhaust hood over it. So yeah, you, you have to intervene in the transport mechanism. You have to paint the wall to keep the ozone in the, the 40 parts per billion ozone from reacting with a, uh, an, an antimicrobial on the paint. And that solves the problem. It's interesting too, like a lot of that, um, those those principles, you know, have really been researched and proven a lot. We were talking about the University of Texas, Austin, some of the research, they've done a lot on those, you know, and, and there's been other yeah. studies, obviously, but uh, that, that group has done a lot of studies on ozone reacting with the actual building products or cleaning products and the reactions, you know, the different types of chemical reactions that you get that are a bit more adverse than maybe we suspected. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Uh, I first uh, learned learned about the ozone stuff from uh, Charlie Weschler. Who, you know, Charlie, I know Charlie. I, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Charlie's been on our, one of our other shows. Indoor oh, Park. that's great. Yeah, to get to get Charlie on that, it's I, I, I love listening to Charlie. He uh, thinks uh, so clearly about things, and he knows so much. So. Yeah, so, and he's yeah, definitely Charlie, Charlie. Charlie's definitely. I you mean, know, he's well. I think there's a lot of you that just to me are just um, uh, very, very much uh, the 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 thought leaders in the industry. You know, I mean, there's and there, we we wouldn't be where we are today without all of the work that you guys have done for these decades, you know, and, and that's true. I, I don't think we're where we need to be either. I qualify <laughs> that by saying it's like, I'm a little disappointed because I had these aspirations as a young man coming in, you know, in the mid eighties <laughs> that we were going to, you know, by, by, you know, by 92, 93, when there's proposed indoor air quality legislation, all this stuff was going to happen. Oh, we're going to fix everything. We're going to fix schools. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, what the hell? It's like 2022. And we're still talking about getting, you know, air changes in classrooms and like, yeah, <laughs> you know, I don't know. Uh, two words, deferred maintenance. <laughs> well, deferred maintenance in almost every aspect of our, our culture has really taken a toll on us. The, um, it, it just, it, it's an easy number to cut uh, when they're doing the budget, you, you know, the maintenance budget. And it, it's hard to, and if we're building maintenance, if you're not talking about residential, Mm -hmm. But if you're talking about building maintenance in commercial and public buildings, uh, it it doesn't frequently get designed in in any reasonable way. Like, it, all right, there's maybe not enough. 
So, I mean, but yeah, anyway, you've, you've taken that, you, you have taken that approach of understanding the building dynamics and underst understanding yeah. how things interact, right? Because that's, that's kind of the important part. It's not just the pollutant. It's, you know, it's. Uh, hey, hang on just one second. I'm uh, online. Okay. I'll, I'll be up in a minute. I'll be up in half an hour. <laughs> Yeah, 30, 31 <laughs> minutes, actually. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, that's that approach, I think, is just, you know, so much it, it makes more sense. It really does. Like, you know, you take more of a holistic approach looking at the whole building as a system of systems. Right. Basically. Yeah, it's I, that's a combination of, uh, as I was saying, growing up in the construction family and, and being a mason's tender and then a carpenter. And, um and, and but also from the time I was in fourth grade or so and knowing that I really wanted to study physics. Um, so it sort of is a funny combination of uh, ha hands-on skills uh, and knowledge, craft knowledge of construction and, and the fundamental principles of uh, mass and energy. Uh, and what? plus a short attention span. Well, yeah, well, that helps, you know, I mean, I, I, that's the only part that I have similar to you is I have the short attention span. I, I don't have any of the knowledge, but I, but I definitely can't stay focused. <laughs> One of the things you did in a presentation years and years ago that I always thought was fascinating and simple, but really gets the point across saying when you're talking in terms of thermal boundaries and pressure boundaries on a building and that you should be able to put the pen down, whatever color it is and draw all the way around and it should go from end to end. Right. Yeah. Have a complete thermal boundary and have a complete pressure boundary. And that's such a simple concept. It's it's constantly missed. <laughs> yeah, that and that that is something that uh, has seeped into the U.S. Um, construction industry, the design and construction in the industry <laughs> in, in the U.S. Did you see the cat? I did. Yeah. <laughs> kitty. I, oh, well, um, the that, cat's good. Uh, yeah, the, that's, well, climbing, the, the, that's climbing, climbing your car. The, uh, the, the idea of being able to trace the insulation layer, the uh, rainwater control layer, and uh, the air barrier around the building has really been widely distributed. And uh, and, and I, I I give Joe Joe Steverick a, a huge. Uh, um, thanks for doing all that work of getting that information out to people. Sure. In the last um, 25, 30 years, he's been yeah, really, it, really it's, trumpeting it's, that. Yeah. Yeah. It's changed the way buildings are constructed, initially residential buildings, mm -hmm. and, and, and eventually uh, the uh, commercial institutional folks have caught up with that in a lot of ways. Uh, and we're getting much better buildings than we did 30 years ago or 20 years ago. Um, still, spec buildings are still a problem because there's, there's, you don't know who the owner's going to yeah. be. Yeah, and there's still a lot. There's still a lot of construction uh, crews that really just don't do the appropriate details to flashings and things like that. That really just come. I mean, I, in my experience, I've seen in stick frame construction one of the biggest failure points. Right, are going to be window and door flashings. It just yeah. seems like that's just a repetitive problem that you just run into all the time. It's this. It's an educational problem in a lot of ways. That I, I can, when uh, the Army Corps of Engineers decided they wanted to uh, lower door test buildings, and they have a, a standard for their all their federal buildings. All federal buildings have ended up. Um, we we worked with uh, um, some some of the big contractors who build those kinds of buildings uh, um, to to improve their envelope detailing and and the, they would learn they, they would pick it up the architects they work with and engineers would learn and they they were doing a great job and, and and after about three or four years we'd start we'd get the same company we we'd go out and we'd get the drawings and we'd go like oh my god <laughs> they didn't learn anything what the heck is going on here and it, and why is that is just that people are just you know, driven to go back to their old ways unless you uh, constantly it, beat them over the head with it? No, it's, well, we, we have, it, education is a continuous process. There's always people leaving the jobs. There's always people who are coming in, new people coming in. Uh, and 
if even if, and if even if you got two people on a seven person team who know about these things they don't always win the arguments so so it takes it's it, and that, that i think is just the the human nature that i i mentioned hasn't really changed in our stories for five thousand years that's how we are uh, I, I try not to fight that i try to realize that um how many times do i have to teach it as many times as it takes that's, uh, that's a key point you hit, though. Education is a continuing process. You're never learned up, are you? <laughs> you know, it's like you uh, shouldn't no. be. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I feel astonishingly stupid all the time. <laughs> uh, you know, okay, but it's but there, smart people feel that way. <laughs> that, that's the problem. People that are not smart tend to think they know everything. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. a, right. People that question themselves and question I'm, their knowledge have to be people that actually could think. I'm, I'm, you're triggering a memory for me. The German, be, before um, uh, the Nazis, uh, the Socialist Party in Germany took o took over. The the highest ranking general it, it said that he divided. It wrote that he divided his officer corps into people who were intelligent. Um, or stupid, and people who were um, uh, industrious or lazy. And he wanted his closest officers to be intelligent and lazy because they would get it, and but they would delegate effectively because they, they were lazy. <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> and he said, but the people you have to find quickly and get them out of the army are people who are stupid and industrious <laughs> that's a dangerous combination is it not? Yes, that's what he said he said they'll destroy your army <laughs> you know I, and and th that holds true to our industry too i think unfortunately or anything actually any industry you know it's it's crazy it, you know in uh earlier today so i was i had a phone call with uh susan valenti who's our editor of healthy indoors magazine and she raised a couple of points i thought was interesting um one being that do we actually is there actually an iq or ieq industry is is there really an industry or is that just like this tent that has a lot of different disciplines underneath it because because it doesn't act like it's a real industry. Like we've been, you've been in it for, no, I mean, seriously, you've been in it 40 years. I've been in it 30 plus years and, and, and we still like, overall, we haven't made the it, it, substantive change that we maybe should have made in the time we've had to do it. I, I mean, collectively, you know, I'm, I'm not saying you individually or, but it, overall, right. It, and it's, it's not like we're a single discipline, like, you know, somebody does plumbing or, you know, like yeah. things that are very easily to define, you know, do you agree with that? That's yeah, an interesting point. I, well, I, I do agree with that. The, the industry is, uh, I, I think it is an industry. It's just a diffuse industry. Um, it, many, many facets, many, many, many disciplines and uh, livelihoods that come together here. And many of them are, um, are small shops. You know, we're, we're not... We're not like uh, the pharmaceutical industry where there's five or six, five or six corporations that run the whole thing, and mm -hmm. and they 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 can make changes uh, that be, because they're well funded and focused. They sure, can they, make they have changes. resources and and, and uh, there's yeah. you're right. I mean, they collectively have control of it, whereas they they do. Yeah. And and they can prevent progress uh, very easily, and and they do. Mm -hmm. But so, so, so but that creates a, an we, issue. For we we don't have industry. leverage, Bob. <laughs> I, yeah, we don't have leverage. <laughs> but but that creates a problem, right? Because how do we come to consensus on on issues? You know, it's difficult, right? Because there's so many <laughs> different players with so many different agendas. Well. You're you know, there's not, there's not like, you know, like who's the organization that, you know, is in charge of indoor air quality and, and every, <laughs> you know, this is the thing in our, my call with Susan <laughs> earlier today she said the same thing. It's like, there's, um, every few years, some organization champions, you know, the cause of indoor environmental quality yeah. and they're going to be the leader, you know, yeah. and then, yeah. And then, <laughs> and then they, you know, they kind of fall by the wayside and nothing changes. <laughs> we'll be the next, we'll be the next leader. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, 
I I don't know. <laughs> um, I I I recall. Uh, uh, an old saying about uh, it was a guy in Alaska, and oh, I know it was uh, McPhee. Um, uh, the curve of binding energy and, and coming into the country. Uh, and, and he, when he, he, he said, when he went to Alaska to learn about Alaska to write, write the coming into the country book, it, the cab driver said, is that, you know, ask him who he is and what's he doing. He said, I'm a writer. I'm, I'm, I came here to get a story. And, uh, and he, and he said, how long are you staying? And, uh, he, he said, uh, uh, well, I, I think I might stay for a uh, uh, few months. And the cab driver said, "Oh, you're writing a book." And and <laughs> and, and he, he said, "Well, how did you know that?" <laughs> and he said, "Well, when a writer comes here, if they're staying for a day, uh, they're 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 writing a they're writing a newspaper story or a radio <laughs> show. And if they're staying for a week, they're writing a magazine article." If they're staying for a month or two, they're, staying, they're writing a book. And, and I missed your point on that. I've got to be honest. That's, I'm actually feeling really obtuse right now. No, because I know there was a really witty point there, and I feel like it's like it went right over. Well, uh, with my short-term memory, I, I don't recall either. So. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> Classic. Oh, man. Um, uh, so. <laughs> yeah, you know, so here's the thing. So, you know, you're you're heading toward retirement because you're not totally retired. So you're not retired yet. You're, you know, Don Weeks keeps saying he's retired, but he's like the president of IEQGA. <laughs> and he's yeah. like, you know, he's on one of the he's on the committee writing the, the rewrite of the bio aerosols book, which X oh, and Krause and those guys and Sherry Marcham and all of them like. Like, so he's like, he's retired, like, I don't know, he's not retired at all. I don't know, you know, retired, maybe he's not billable <laughs> yeah, he's hours. He doesn't have cut, billable hours. He's, he's cut back from eight hours a week to 60, you know? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, he just cut back probably his billable revenue. That's all he's cut back. He hasn't cut back. Oh, well, there is that. So, so I guess my, my question is, like, I, it, there, I, there doesn't seem to be a mechanism by which we, we foster the, the new generation of people in this industry mm -hmm. and i know in pre-show we talked about this a little there's um i mean not to say there's there's obviously a whole new generation of people in the industry coming up but but they don't seem to have the same um and from my perspective they don't seem to be the same as we were coming up in the 90s you know in early 2000s where we were like constantly trying to push the envelope and push things forward and and make change and, and do stuff and it seems like at least a lot of the people, at least on on the uh, the private sector side, I can't, you know, academia is a different story, but on the yeah. private sector side, it seems like they punch their time clocks. You know, like, I mean, there's people doing the work, but are they are they actually moving the industry that forward? Well, uh, they're they're maintaining the industry. OK. All right. Uh, uh, which is and if you think about things ecologically, uh, the when a, when you have a big disturbed system, it's the pioneering species that do well. And they have, they reproduce quickly, they have rapid growth. That, that That's kind of where we were is, is uh, and so that was, that was valued. But as, as the secession occurs and you get um, more longer lived species, the more and more of the energy goes from growth into maintenance. And and so as the, it, it makes sense that we we don't need <laughs> eccentrics like me <laughs> in in an in industry that's more maintenance oriented. Yeah, but we we, we need people who can do the work competently and um and in in a an economically affordable uh, way. That's. Uh, and and the, and it, it's a livelihood for them. But are, I mean, are we are we in the, are we at that point yet, Terry? Though I mean, like I don't think the industry has evolved to the point where we can say we're in the maintenance point. We still haven't figured out how to make buildings really healthy for people yet. I mean, we figured it out well, some, most of it, but we haven't we haven't evolved to the point where that's where we're at. Where we're actually maintaining healthy environments. Where 
Or have we? Well, it's in a bunch of ways. We've, we've always maintained healthy environments. And that's what I, I, I think of the invention of chimneys as uh, one, one of the first uh, <laughs> innovations in indoor air quality. And, and uh, the, the folks who designed and maintained indoor combustion devices were, were the, the innovators and the, the inventors. Um, so, so it it's it cycles. It it, go, it goes in cycles, right? and mm -hmm. right now we we have learned a huge amount in the last forty years about indoor the indoor environment and uh, what causes health problems and or health problems for the building itself, and uh, and we've learned how to intervene in them. And, and with the, the the new generation, they're going to figure out the stuff that I got wrong. You and I got wrong. <laughs> Bill Turner okay. got wrong. <laughs> you, you know, they'll have to fix that stuff. <laughs> but you guys got a lot right. And my, I guess the concern is, is how do we make sure that all the stuff that you learned, you know, and I say you collectively, you know, you, Bill Turner, I, there's, you know, there's a list of, you know, 50 people that really were, you know, maybe more than 50, 100, yeah, you know, that, that, you know, that really, really were the names that you saw repetitively as I was coming up in the industry, seeing these same people, you know, and how, how do we, I, I guess the question is, is how do we make sure that we, we uh, you know, pass the baton effectively, you know, and not, and not lose a lot of it? I've seen this like just in just in industry uh, facilities management people where people that run, you know, run. Plans. Oh, yeah. uh, I'm not going to pick one of my big clients, a government entity. Most of the people have retired. I've worked at this this facility for 27 yeah, years. Absolutely. So they had they had a great crew. They had they knew how all the mechanical systems worked in all these buildings, over 2000 systems they were maintaining. And now everybody's retired and they've never written or logged any of it down so that like that all that experience is gone yeah yeah it's i'm <laughs> blade blade runner yeah blade runner the soliloquy in blade runner from with rector howard sitting there holding harrison ford by the hand so he doesn't fall off the building <laughs> that that that's it the things i've seen that won't be passed on or cleaning up here i've got Boxes and boxes of all the raw data from all the research projects, and it's it's never been even twenty five percent mined for what we might have learned from it. And, and and I was thinking, well, who who could I give that to who would be able to find some use for it? And, and I thought, well, there are lots of people I know who could find some use for it, but they have the same big volume of research project data that they've never had the chance to fully explore and they're never going to have the chance because right. because we we never have the budget to really explore the data that we collect so so it's uh that that's a i see no no real solution to that problem well, maybe for the data, but at least for just for the methodology, for just you know, like the the the, the maybe the ten thousand foot or five thousand foot overview of just how you would approach a situation, you know, and, and not to say that's the right way or wrong way, but it's a way that's proven, you know, for you for decades to be effective, right? You know, and it, it, yeah. it just it, to me it makes no sense to have the next wave of people in this industry have to reinvent the wheel necessarily. Well, the the things that seem to work for for me and that I've seen work for others is to maintain your curiosity. And when you're curious and you have developed the skills to design an experiment or a test that will give you a result that is meaningful, um, those are the skills that that can be taught. That's the ten thousand foot overview: how to actually be a a critical thinker and uh, and and figure out and the question that that's very useful that almost no one ever asked themselves is how how do I know what I know and and how do I develop confidence that what I'm doing is working the way it should which which is at the heart of uh, commissioning buildings mm -hmm. it, it's exactly that and sure. that's 
when I'm uh, part of the commissioning team, I'm always working with the trades. And that's my always my first question to them is, when you do your work, when you install your product, how do you, how do you, you do something now? I know you do something now because you're a competent worker. What do you do to convince yourself that it's installed correctly and it's going to work function the way it should work? And and they all do something for that. They all have ideas and they all have answers for that. And so what we're going to do is document that. And and we're also going to come around and we're going to test. We're going to we're going to inspect and we're going to talk to you and we're going to ask you to take pictures and write down the things that you're doing that demonstrate that you've done a good job. That that's maybe is the million dollar question, right? You know, how 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 do you believe you know what you know and uh, and and then documenting, but that that's I, that's the key, right? Otherwise, if you, if we don't document what what we've done and wh how we got to where we are here, it, it will be lost. You know, a lot of it will be lost. The, the process, yeah. that, right? I mean, just I mean, you can like cast so much down. Found. <laughs> well, lost, <laughs> reinvented. Yeah, people are gonna people are yeah. gonna rediscover. You know, the same concepts. <laughs> I guess the, the forward thinkers. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I, I, I myself yeah. <laughs> invented invented some. Uh, um, uh, linear algebra principles that uh, I, <laughs> in order to model uh, thermal performance of building assemblies and stuff like that back in the 70s, and uh, and and it, it it turned out, of course, there was an ancient body of knowledge in linear algebra that <laughs> did the same thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, New Newtonian approximations and Euler e e equations. Well, that means you were on the right track. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, or you were means, both wrong. <laughs> means I, I have one of the finest minds of the 16th century. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you've had a long career. I mean, that's, <laughs> uh, you know. <laughs> uh, so oh, so we, we are continually reinventing things, and uh, there's so many of us, and that's the way we work. Uh, mm -hmm. And it, it's it's a... Uh, it's a wonderful way. We we also I I, I think, and may, maybe America leads in this. We muddle through, we, <laughs> you know, like ants trying to move a moth through the forest yeah. of grass. Yeah. <laughs> we we but we do it, and and uh, and it bubbles up from us. Uh, so, I that that's where we're headed. And when you see that work that needs to be done right in front of you, do it. No, it, it makes sense. It makes sense. Um, oh, <laughs> Henri Fennell uh, made a comment in here a while ago, and I'm just seeing it now. Uh, so he 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 made a comment about uh, the codes, you know, how how codes have been, you know, how they progressed. And because there has been some building codes have changed a bit. But I mean, Absolutely. I guess qualify the fact that a building code is the lowest denominator standard that you can get away with building to. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, that's true. I mean, um, right. It's the least acceptable. You know, that's the bare minimum. <laughs> It, it, well, well, uh, I'm, I, of course, I'd like to say uh, thanks for the comment, Ari, and it's always good to hear from you. Um, and, and I've learned so much from Ari over the years. Um, the, the second thing I like that's coming to mind, though, is back in the 80s, uh, Chuck Silver and I, for the New York State Energy Office, um, did a series of uh, workshops for builders. And when we when we first first did the workshops we we got people who were kind of pioneering souls who who wanted to figure out how to do how to make low energy use buildings and and not have the problems and uh by the by the fourth year the the code had changed and you had a for example have windows that met a minimum standard and you had to insulate the basement <laughs> and and that then we got all of a sudden a whole flux of people who had no interest whatsoever in the science of buildings, but the code had changed and they needed to, they needed to know how to insulate a basement. <laughs> so, so the, I, I, Henri is, is in my experience, correct. We, you know, early on you, you get 10% of the people who are out there because they're curious, they're interested in it, and and they 
they bring some other people along with them. And, and then at the end, when you finally get a minimum code about the, the thing, you, you get the, the final 10% who, mm -hmm. who, who, come, who comes in with the agenda of trying to figure out a way they can do it that looks like it works, but is cheap. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, couldn't we just uh, you know uh, staple bubble wrap over that foundation? <laughs> you know, uh, well, no, that you, you, that's uh, fire hazard. We can't do. <laughs> we can't yeah, do that. It, that's that's a good point, you know. And and I I think especially in the residential could well no I, I this is true not just residential construction commercial construction, you know there's still you know, there, there's a ways to go with that too. You know, I, I think, I think how, what's your yeah. feeling on that is, it, are, are we more, are we more attuned to doing things better in the commercial side or the residential side or neither? I mean, how, how do you see it? Um, I, uh, I think it's a, uh, it's much easier to make changes in the residential side um, because uh, uh, there are far fewer players in that on the team the if you if you go to a this is something i learned from watching joe steberg over the years it, it, if you make an inroad with a vice president at a company that's putting up ten thousand houses a year or two thousand houses a year and you convince that person that really this house should have some ventilation or really this house should have should pay attention to the flashings around the windows uh, and if you do that stuff, by the way, you're, we're going to cut your warranty cost by 80% over the next two years. Uh, uh, Joe was brilliant at, at making that kind of thing work. And, um, and, and he's re is brilliant at reaching key people to make changes that multiply and spread out. Right. In, in uh, that, in that, case you, that person can affect some serious change if they're building thousands of homes you know it's a builder at scale yeah and, and it can change very quickly with that kind mm -hmm. of a thing but commercial buildings and um public buildings institutional buildings uh there's there's a, a large array of professionals involved and uh the architects engineers mm -hmm. la landscapers uh, owners reps, clerk of the works, general contractors, subcontractors, multiple construction, general construction man management firm. On top of that, construction yeah. management it used to be the clerk of the works. And, yeah. You know, when I was young, it would be the clerk of the works, and that then they were, and so it, it's a lot more complicated. And they they all have the their own knowledge set and skills that they bring to the job. And the, my experience is the problems largely grow up in the cracks between the disciplines uh, there. So, so uh, the solutions are are usually getting trying to get people together. But for me, for me, one of the the I think the most effective things I ever figured out how to do in commercial and institutional buildings uh, uh, is when I've been part of the commissioning process for the therm the envelope of the building. And, and there's all, no matter how many drawings you do or how much detail or what's in the specs, there's always conditions where you've got four different materials coming together. And there, there wasn't a detail drawn up that really shows how to do that. And, and when I would be doing inspections, I'm always thinking about where those spots are gonna be. And when they come up, I I just turned to the the guy, the QA guy from the general who I'm usually walking around with and they say Roger uh, we need to get the the who who's on site from the roofers who's on site from the window guys and who's on site from the insulation guys we need them all up here right now because mm -hmm. we're all going to look at this together and we need the who's here from the architects and the engineering office we're gonna we're gonna look at this until we get ideas, and then someone's gonna write a uh, architect supplemental instructions, or they're gonna issue a new detail, or and, and I don't care about how how you guys do that, but here's what we have to actually get done, and it's great because the you know when you get the trades people there on site, they look at it and they go. Oh yeah, you know we had this product like 
four years ago that we used and mm -hmm. this is how you know or, or well, oh yeah well, you're drawing you're drawing on everybody's expertise yeah. and experience there oh. as opposed to having somebody just trying to come down from above but do you think that's normally the case i mean that you're you're describing a project that you're involved in <laughs> you know where you have yeah. somebody like you there that's actually saying hey collectively we got to get together but is that is that the norm you think in construction or is that are, are you an outlier there uh I, i'm probably an outlier it's uh, it's way more common that no one will notice it until the first year of occupancy right when you start having and, failures yeah when it's failed that would yeah. be probably one of the more common ones um but there are there are some very very skilled and knowledgeable and intelligent people working in, in the, with the, the subs and in the uh, architectural firms and in the construction management companies and the, the, the big contractors, they have some very skilled people. And there are a lot of them who catch this stuff before it, it all falls apart. Um, but the, the, a lot of time, and, and they're more likely to actually call a, like a, an informal we're going to have an informal meeting right now. <laughs> mm -hmm. well, <laughs> because, it's, in their, it's in their vested interest to do that as it opposed is. to having a failure. You know, I mean, and, and the best of them know that and they, and they develop those people to be their troubleshooters mm -hmm. and to keep things moving along. Um, but as I said earlier, the, you know, the, the construction industry, there's big turnover. It's boom and bust. People come and go, and we lose the that knowledge sometimes, and we lose the teams, the winning teams sometimes, uh, because of that. Uh, but that that certainly is uh, the, in my experience, the best way to um, get a building that works is to have someone performing that function of looking at where the looking out for where the trouble spots are most likely to be. And getting the the people who are going to be responsible for actually making it work right there, and, and anytime I can use their idea, I I have a better chance of getting a getting it installed correctly. Well, you're getting buy-in. I guess I guess it's a collective. It, it's a collective solve to a problem. Yeah, absolutely. There, the if if it's if I come up with an idea that will work, but the the worker doesn't like it, there's a pretty good chance it's not going to work. It's going to get well, because they may have a reason for why they don't like it, you know, and it may not just be being stubborn. It may actually be like this oh, isn't going to work. They they yeah. just, like I don't I don't agree. And they get the chance to say that stuff when I'm on the job and in my initial kickoff meetings that the, everybody's there. We put all the details that I'm nervous about up on the board <laughs> and and uh, the architects and the engineers are in the room and the the mason who's installing the flashing gets to say, oh, well, that's not that's never going to look work. Look at how it sequences. That's, <laughs> you know, well, well, what can we do to fix that? <laughs> right. And, and again, that's the but that's that's using a team approach. Yeah, it's. The best way it's to do that's what works in my experience. That, yeah, that's I, I what totally works. agree. I totally agree. I mean, all my years yeah. as a football coach, same mindset. You know, you, you want, yeah. like, you know, the head coach that uh, goes out there and knows everything. No, you want a collective team of assistant coaches and you powwow, you know, and it's like, <laughs> what are you seeing? <laughs> yeah, yeah. What's going on here? Yeah, what, what do you do think? How do we handle this? <laughs> and why Why would we want to shut out the, the brilliance of, uh, Two thirds of the people working on the job. <laughs> you, you know, know why? I, because because there's because it's 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 human nature in some people that are either trying to protect their turf or just the egos, right? They just don't they don't want to acknowledge that you know we are all better through collectively working together. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, well, it's, it's called well, evolution. It's a little bit, but it's <laughs> it's hard for some people to grasp the concept that you may not know everything. <laughs> it, it's muddling through. <laughs> Yeah, you know, um, uh, Jim Fitzgerald, right? Yes. Met, I yeah, you, you met Jim. Uh, I Jim, have. Jim, Jim is, uh, we're burning daylight, boys. <laughs> well, he's a little outspoken, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, yeah, he's not shy about, about things. But he, he, one of the, this is part of, I think, Jim, Jim's own brilliance is, uh, and genius is, um, 
he gets a quick sense of what's going on and he goes forward with uh, with a solution. And, and I'm way more likely to study it and think about it and try thought experiments or do some testing. And, and, and you know, and Jim will get it done and be off and gone while I'm still scratching my head with a perplexed look on my face. <laughs> You know, it, it, there's different approaches. I mean, the one thing yeah. that you, you did you mention, need, I think, is super that. important. That we, but you know what? We still, it, it's critical that all of us, and but I'm going to say us. And I'm I'm giving myself more credit than I deserve. You know, all of you guys that are the really the brilliant forces in the industry. You know, somehow transition your, you know, impart your knowledge on this next phase of the industry that you know and I, I now it's like an old geezer saying you know like about you know those new <laughs> yeah, kids but i mean right. you know I, I still first of all i can't even reconcile that terry I, I can't even deal with the fact that i'm one of the old guys now that's like <laughs> i'm i'm really struggling with that I, i'm not gonna lie i have bad news it gets worse <laughs> yeah it's not, it's not none of us are getting out of here alive i mean that's, that's yeah. how it all ends uh but but that being said, you know, it's like it really is. I think it's really important. So so what my one challenge to you is I'm going to say, uh, you know, I'd like to see you and uh, other people, uh, you know, with your experience and your level of you know involvement all these years in the industry, uh, you know, at least maybe uh, try to get involved with, you know, via our community platform, which we launched. We'll talk to you more about that. Uh, we have that we have that portal that is really open to the world that, you know, people, people like yourself could be thought leaders there. I'm not saying spend all your retirement years doing that, but, you know, at least kicking in here and there, maybe, you know, and, and just giving an opportunity to engage with some of the, the newcomers to the industry and some of the, you know, the mid-level people that, you know, could benefit from that, you know, mentoring, you know, I guess, you know, it's for yeah. want of a better word. Well, that's you it. Know, I think We're we need that. together. Well, we're we're over time now, and I know you're you're, you're, you're in the middle. You're in the middle of moving, so I, you know, I, yeah, I, yeah. I, like, I have a I have a deck I'm taking apart right now. <laughs> so yeah, that's that that's challenging in and of itself. So I, I'm gonna um I'm I'm gonna do a couple of credits here, and then uh, we'll come back for a quick wrap. Um, so uh, as I uh, briefly alluded to, uh, Healthy Indoors, um, you know, we've been involved uh, with a lot of things. Obviously, our, our flagship is uh, HealthyIndoors.com, where you can get to our monthly publication, Healthy Indoors Magazine. That's, uh, that's accessible to everybody. It's free to the world. We've been, well, we're coming up on our nine years publishing it, which that, that went by real freaking fast. We also have a community. Community platform is basically a, a platform that's centric. You can see uh, Terry's bright face there, but it's... Uh, Healthy Indoors Online Global Community. It's at global.healthyindoors.com. Uh, we have all of our content archived there from Healthy Indoors, the magazine, the shows, shows from other organizations, uh, live stream events, but a lot more than that. It's actually a place where you can network and uh, communicate with other people in the world. There's a whole networking platform there. So it's, uh, it's, it's really quite revolutionary. Terry, I, I so appreciate. It. I'm telling you, I'm, I'm having you here on the show. You're, you, you, I've been wanting to have you on the show for three years now. That we've been doing the live weekly show, and uh, I'm just happy that you could take time out of your day to be here because uh, it's always a pleasure to see uh, see and speak with you. You know, uh, uh, thank you. The, you know, the feeling is mutual. Uh, I, and that means a lot to me, buddy. You know, it's like, yeah, you know, I tr truly love you, man. Um, so we're going to be back next week. Uh, well, of course we are, right? Because uh, now that we yeah. re restart the 20, well, we, we took a long pause. I was off for like seven months because I, you know, I had other things to do in my life. Uh, but, but I can't, so we're doing the weekly show again. Next week, we're going to be joined by uh, Michael Pinto. We're going to be talking about uh, a bunch of stuff. He did a lot, of, a lot of field study work with Air Answers Technology and stuff. And it'll be interesting. He's uh, in the last, uh, in April and May, I believe April and May, yeah, get this straight. The April and May issue is a Healthy Indoors magazine. He published a, a, a two uh, uh, a, a two issue uh, article on that, and so he he's coming on next week to speak about it. So I'm real excited about that. Um, again, uh, we'll uh, we'll be back. Uh, 
1 to 2 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time next week for the Healthy Indoor Show. Again, my guest, Terry Brennan. Uh, great to see you. Good luck with the rest of your move. You're taking it back oh, down. I, that sounds like a lot of I hear the hammering in the background. It's great. <laughs> So um, for uh, for Healthy Indoors Magazine, uh, Healthy Indoor Show, I'm Bob Crowell, founder and publisher. Uh, yeah, you know, and uh, chief provocateur here. Uh, we'll see you next week. Same bat time, same bat channel for the Healthy Indoor Show.